Dear Montessori colleagues and friends all over the world, hello and welcome. This is Montessori Institute Prague podcast, Montessori love stories that need to be told. My name is Mirka, I'm the host of this podcast, and I'm really excited that you're listening to us right now, and I really hope you're going to enjoy this. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, thank you for accepting the invitation to be my guest on this podcast. It's a new podcast. It's a new experience for me as well. And I have to say I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, I, I'm talking to people that are friends and colleagues and mm -hmm. Just sharing, just sharing a little bit of time with them and asking and finding out about their stories. The podcast is called Montessori Love Stories That Need to Be Told. And I, you know, at some point I realized that I'm really blessed with knowing so many amazing Montessorians who have all these incredible stories and that I would like to start capturing those stories and saving them and just like sharing with others and Uh, everybody has a lesson that they learned that they can share with others and then others can learn from those lessons. So it's just about stories and um, about uh, listening to each other. So thank you for coming. And for our listeners, my guest today is Jenny Hoglund. Uh, sometimes people call you Jenny, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, that would be my name. Yes. yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Jenny, uh, Jenny is from Sweden. She lives in Sweden. She lives all over the world, but her home in, uh, is in Sweden. Um, and Jenny, apart from being a great friend and one of my um, most valued Montessori colleagues in this world, uh, she's an AMI 6 to 12 and 12 to 18 trainer. She's a founder of a school uh, of, a, of a, Jenny, now tell me, primary and elementary or just elementary? No, oh. it's, it's an infant community. It's an HOI, okay. a, a children's house and an elementary. Thank you. So she's and an adolescent program. Thank you so much. So uh, I was going to mention the adolescent program. So Jenny's founded a school where they serve from infancy up to the time when a child goes to the up, up, uh, to the adolescent program and Jenny's actually running a wonderful adolescent program called Montessori program for work and study Lara for mm -hmm. live it which means school, uh, education for life yeah learning yes. for life mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, it's a school where my son studied for two years so it's very personal for me as well today um, we will share the website later it will be also connected to the podcast so people can check out the website of the school and uh, the website where you can find out all about AMI training for adolescent workers and everything else mm -hmm. so but now I, I I'm sure that our listeners want me to stop talking and start listening to Jenny <laughs> so Jenny I have shared with you, I have four simple questions. And the, the first one is, I would like to know who you are. Then the second question is, what was your story before you came across Montessori? Then how did you hear about Montessori first? And then what was your life like after and what are you doing today that you can share with us? So please, Jenny, who are you? <laughs> right. I, I, I think you will get very different answers depending on who you ask here, you know. Um, I think I'm just an ordinary person who had the privilege to stumble on Montessori, which really, I think, as for many of us, changed my life. And, um, and it was just by pure chance. And you asked me what, what my story is. And I think that my story is rather diverse. I had a high school teacher. I did, when I went to high school, I did all of the sciences. So our class teacher was um, Eva and she was a teacher in math and physics. And she said to us girls, 
don't get married until you are at least 30. Make <laughs> sure <laughs> and make sure that you get to do what you would like to do before that. And then she also gave us a, um, another tip, she says, and when you get married, if you get married, pretend you know nothing about household chores. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that's, <laughs> that sort of became my life. So I did, did do a, very many different things actually before I became a Montessorian. Um, tried out really very many things and for which I'm actually grateful because I think I can truly say that I have encountered many aspects of life and I worked with those who had had newspaper as wallpaper because you know to keep the cold out. I also worked with in very affluent circumstances. Um, I have visited people in prison mm. <laughs> and in hospitals. I've been, um, I've been, um, one, once I was asked by a, a sea officer who was a captain on this one, on one of these ships that goes with the uh, cars from Japan to the UK. And, and he phoned me, he was on sea and at sea. And he said, you know, Jenny, my wife is going to, she is about to give birth. Can you go and support her? You know, so yes, and I met tremendous people. I met those who, who came on a Russian ship and we were, and, and, and they had, bodyguards with them because they were not allowed to move freely. They were not, this was in the seventies. So they mm -hmm. came from Soviet Union. Um, and so I think over the years, I've learned a lot about what it means to be privileged. And, and of course, when I encountered Montessori, my idea was that why shouldn't every child be a privileged child and how can we make that happen? And even if one can only, <laughs> you know, make that happen for a few or even make just something for one child, I suppose one has to be rather happy about that. Mm. Yes, because if we each do that for one child, then a lot of children can be privileged. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And it was when I worked, I, I was a, sub, a teacher in a traditional <clears throat> middle school. It only lasted for a year. <laughs> and, and I was working with um, these 15, 16 years old. And in one of the classes that I worked with, we had this young man who skipped school a lot. And, and the head of school, this, the headmaster said to me, this, this was a big public school, traditional school, he said, you need to speak to him. He can't miss school that much. And then I was, you know, there talking to him about the importance of coming to school. And he said to me, he looked at me and he said, why should I? I will never get a grade anyway. And, you know, that really struck me as tragic in a way, because here he was, he was turning 16. It was his last year of compulsory school. And he saw absolutely no future for himself. But when I biked to school, I, I biked to school and my chain broke. He was the first one to fix that for me so I could bike home again. But, you know, that didn't count it. That didn't count at all. Uh, anyway, so that's when I left and I understood that this is probably not what I would like to do. Mm. Yeah. And you don't know uh, what happened to him after that? You no, know? I don't. I wish I did, though, but mm. no. Yeah. Well, and that's the next thing, you know, when you work with students and you, adolescents, and you in a traditional setting and you just meet group after group for your subject area. You know, it's not that you have 30 students there that you know each and every one of them. 
you have like you meet 90 students that you need to keep track of and it's not that personal at all mm -hmm. as it is in a Montessori environment yeah. and you can't individualize the learning which I think is what we do so well in Montessori. Mm. Well I bet that if if you were able to know where he is, maybe he's now a repairman having a wonderful business and because you have encouraged him, you know, I'm pretty sure you thanked him for repairing your bike. I did indeed, yes. Mm. And, and maybe he felt um, mm. valued and, you know. Yeah, you know. and that's also what I, I enjoy with Montessori because when I, you know, I do keep in, <laughs> in contact with a lot of the, the adolescents that we have that have graduated from us and and they doing so many diverse things but they are doing something that they all had a passion for and some have become professional dancers ballroom dancers some are you know in the music business some are you know, doing these practical jobs like being an electrician, some are civil engineers, some are doctors or lawyers, but they all did, I think, something that they felt was their thing and that they were would be good at. Yes, like my son, multimedia design and photography. <laughs> yep, I know. And I think that's, you know, they, they come out with a very realistic view of who they are and they are happy and comfortable with whom they are and i think that's the important thing yes totally yes i yeah i could remember my adolescence and <laughs> it yeah. <wasn't> like that <laughs> okay so i'm really interested to hear about when you first heard about montessori please tell me yeah, when did I feel? I heard about Montessori when I got a job that entailed uh, professional development of um, a group um, of um, people, uh, staff that worked with children and adolescents. And um, one of the, the children's house or the primary uh, teachers. She was a Montessori teacher, so I ended up in a Montessori children's house there and, and, and met this teacher who was trained by Ragnhild Hof mm -hmm. in Denmark. And Ragnhild Hof, she was trained by Dr. Montessori. Mm -hmm. And visiting that children's house made me really wonder, you know, uh, about things and because I didn't know anything about Montessori I was sent on a study tour to visit Montessori environments and then you know it then then I also got to visit adolescents in a Montessori environment who seemed very happy to be doing the work they were doing although it was in a more regular environment it was nothing on the land or at a farm but anyway, they seemed happy. And I remember the adolescents I used to work with who, you know, the minute you left the environment, the classroom, you could hear the noise level rise. And, and when you came back, it settled down again. And here I encountered young people who seemed to be happy to work and chat in a friendly way without an adult even being there. Mm -hmm. And that made me wonder why it worked for them, mm -hmm. not for the, the uh, adolescents that I met in the traditional school. Mm -hmm. So where was that? Which country and what school was it? It was actually in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. This, was in, this was in the 70s, uh -huh. mm -hmm. early 70s, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Which is a very different... Um, Montessori in a way, you know, in Amsterdam, but still it was an eye opener to me. Mm -hmm. mm. So when you walked in to the three to six classroom for the first time, would you, would you remember what was it like when you first saw what the environment and the children? Do you have a memory of that? Yes, I do. But, you know, they, they were so industrious. They were and they were kind and generous. And there was this happy, warm 
atmosphere and it was not very loud. It wasn't, you know, people jumping up and down on cushions or, <laughs> you know, being loud. They, they all seemed to be so happy and satisfied with what they were doing. And then they walked about and they sort of visited one another and talked and then they went back to their work and it was really very pleasant and no toys mm. nothing of those things that one would expect in a traditional uh, you know kindergarten mm. uh -huh. so thank you for sharing that and when you were at that point of like you've seen Montessori and um you probably were at a point of real deciding, is this going to be my journey or am I going to do something else? What was it that made the decision for you? What is it about Montessori that, you know, that you decided to go for it? I think I just became very intrigued about these children and these adolescents. And I remember visiting a lower elementary six to nine. And I remember asking the teacher there, who was American, I said, you know, don't you have any discipline problems at times, you know? And he looked at me like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, you know, and I said, well, surely there must be, you know, sometimes a situation. And then he said, he was thinking, and then he said to me, well, I remember once, and just that, I remembered once, and he had been a teacher for so many years, and I had a, a, a young boy. So then I sort of asked him, so yes, what was he up to? Well, he was making, what do you call that? When he, he um, took pieces of paper and crumbled them together, and then he sort of put them on the table and did like this. Uh -huh over the environment, you know, which I suppose one is not supposed to do. That was the worst scenario he had experienced, obviously. And then I said, okay, I said, so how did that end? And he said, well, I gave him a newspaper. And he, I said, why don't you make 200 more of those and see if you can get them into the waste paper basket there. And, and, and the boy did, he, he made about 20 and then he stopped and then he started to work again. And I think that was such a lovely way not to say you can't do this, this is forbidden, don't do that, but offered him some another solution so the boy didn't have to, he was never reprimanded, you know, and he wasn't, told that he was doing something that wasn't expected of him but he came to you know it was solved in such a nice way without the boy having to lose his face or the teacher having to be upset and I thought that was a very uh, I th thought that was a great approach and yeah anyway so then I got intrigued and I said I, I did envision myself as a Montessori teacher but I I I decided I had to study this a bit further to, uh, to see what it was all about. And the first book I read was The Absorbent Mind. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great book. Mm -hmm. And I think it still is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, I just want to mention something that caught my interest when you said that you asked this teacher about, like, don't you ever have discipline problems? Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen you give orientation courses many times and actually now people ask you what do you do with discipline problems at the farm you know that's a quite that's like the first question people ask <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> so mm. that's really interesting so just just uh, to, to mention that that I uh, people are now asking you that question <laughs> yeah. okay so you've read absorbent mind and Yes, and then <laughs> I read The Secret of Childhood, and then I plowed through most of the Montessori books. And in those days, one got them from Kalakshetra, mm -hmm. from, and they were, 
you know, printed in India. So they came in all shapes and forms, not always even paper, you, you know, it, it, and they came with this intriguing smell <laughs> with the, of curry and I don't know what, but anyway, um, yeah. No, and then I just wanted to become trained and that's how it happened. Okay. So where at, first, at first I actually took a job in a Montessori school just to, to uh, um, that was in 1982, just to see what it could be like to uh -huh. work in a Montessori environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where did you do your first diploma course? I did that in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but my trainings are done for the three to six and six to 12 are done in the States. Uh -huh. And Jenny, you also hold a zero to three diploma, is that right? No? no. Okay. Okay. So you have a three to six, six to twelve, and well, you are twelve. And I, yeah. And and I wish I had a zero to three because our school once hosted a zero to three training. I think, but yeah. Mm. Well, you can. But I was busy working with elementary st yeah. students, and yeah. You can come to Prague and do one with Heidi. Yes, we'd, we'd love I to. Have, have you. you know, I, I I think I'm worried about all this practical stuff. I'm not very good at. At, um, with my hands in, when it comes to sewing and doing all of that. When I worked in the six to nine, I had, <laughs> I lost a button once. And then I decided that I would try to, to you know, put it back on. So I put myself down uh, on the chair there and I took out the sewing kit and, and then I was, about to do it and then an elementary child came up to me and she looked at me and she said Jenny give it to me I'll do it for you <laughs> and that's the way it is I'm so <laughs> sad to say that <laughs> yeah. so you did your uh, 6 to 12 diploma and then you became you came back to Sweden and you became a teacher or did how, what, what you know what was your journey after that yes I, I, I did so I worked <laughs> Uh, teacher and then in 1989 we we started the very first Montessori adolescent environment in Sweden and we started in a garage mm -hmm. and how did you know yeah and was that after you had a di uh, diploma yeah. yes okay so you trained in the US and you knew yeah. how to mm -hmm. yes how was that experience doing that for the very first time? And who were your students? It, it was actually very exciting. And it they were students who had been in Montessori. Um, yeah, since children's house. This school didn't have an A to I environment, but they did have children's house. And um, elementary was an AMI school. And so they came with great experience and we were given this garage which had been a double garage for Loris so it was quite big uh, and we had a floor we had walls that were newly new, newly done and apart from that it was empty so we could just sit there on the floor and decide what our environment should be like and what we were going to do in this environment. And I think that was a great experience to build up an environment together with the, the adolescents so they could have this ownership because they shape their environment and we also could plan the study and work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, who, were the are you, who were the people you did your adolescent uh, training with in the US? Were there some uh, colleagues that you're still in mm -hmm. touch with? And so, so the, the very first kind of orientation I participated in, uh, I think was in 1992, 1993 maybe, mm -hmm. in, in Baltimore. And it was all arranged by Namta and David Kahn. I, ever since I've been trained, I every year I visited, you know, or, or participated in one or two NAMTA conferences. And I'm a bit sad <laughs> that they aren't around anymore, that they were great um, conferences to go to, to be
be refreshed in your understanding and knowledge and also to meet colleagues and, and talk shop. Yeah. And the, the very first then um, um, practitioners that um, shared their experiences were all Americans actually, mm -hmm. because they have been doing that for such a long time. Uh -huh. And, and um, so Larry Schaefer was one and he passed away last year. And um, also John McNamara, who actually <laughs> became, I think, one of my, I, I like to see him as a, he's a great friend, but, and a colleague, but also one of my mentors, because um, he in a classroom is something very, or in an environment, I should say, something very special. Yeah. Mm. For people who don't know what Namta is, can you please explain a little bit and tell us about Namta a little bit? Mm -hmm. So Namta uh, is the North American Montessori Teachers Association. And I think it started in the 60s and there were different Montessori teachers who took upon themselves to, uh, you know, be in charge, so to speak, of Namta. And I think in the 70s, uh, David Kahn became the Namta person and he later then became the executive director of Namta and he stayed with uh, Namta, you know, for, I mean, I don't know how many years, it must have been 30 years or something like that. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, and it, it used to be a, um, I think you uh, like a voluntary job. And I remember when I visited David um, many years ago, his, the Namta office was in his guest bedroom. And, <laughs> And all the journals were packed in were in their garage, and his two children were sitting there putting them the journals into envelopes and putting addresses and sending them around in, uh, in you know around the world. But anyway, and then it became um, a more of a, I suppose, paid position, and uh, with a little office and all of it and and I think Namta did a lot for for uh, Montessori teachers. Yes, so I want to say that Namta still has a functional website. I think it's namta.org uh, for people who want to check it out and uh, they throughout their uh, period of when they were in function they have published something that Jenny mentioned called the Namta journals mm -hmm. uh, which are a wealth of wisdom on Montessori and they can still be ordered some of it right some of it can yeah. be ordered online so if you're looking for um, food for thought and um, food for your heart and for your soul if you're a Montessorian we highly recommend for you yeah. to check it out they have they they also published you know lectures by Montessori and they're also you know um write-ups by, by practitioners, but as you say, they are a great source for many things. And they usually have a theme, so it depends what you're interested in, but, but they are great reads, for sure. And, and also, they published one of my most favorite books in my lifetime, the whole School Montessori Management <laughs> Handbook. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And then I think that until today remains to be the resource for anybody who wants to open a school. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there are, so. yeah, a lot of, I think it has been rewritten, right? I think there are. I don't think so. It's out of print, but I have heard uh, rumors. No, but I think I have, I think it was first one edition and then there oh, is yes. a second oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. edition. Yeah. But, yeah. but, and now it might be out of print, but as you said, it, it's, it's, <laughs> very helpful if you wanted to start yes and uh i i heard the rumors that david is talking to colleagues who would like to help him to rewrite it and update it so hopefully <laughs> yeah, look we can keep our fingers crossed yes <laughs> yes yeah. okay so namta and you go back to the namta conferences and you're building the adolescent program in this garage and how long did it take you from that moment until you first thought maybe I'll become 
an adolescent trainer myself one day. <laughs> I, I, you know, to be quite honest, I never thought about that. I think it just, I think it just, I think I just, I think I was asked because um, after the orientation, so to speak, that I attended, the, the next one was in 1997 in Cleveland. That was six weeks. And I was asked to work on that orientation. And then there was another one. And then in 2003, it became a regular uh, thing every summer. And, and um, yeah, and so I worked on an orientation every summer, actually, since 2003. <laughs> so well, I think that, um, so, so when AMI uh, considered making the NAMTA orientation into a diploma course, uh, that I, I was one of those who were asked if we could consider form a yes. little group to, to uh, think about what that could look like. But okay. before that, the NAMTA orientation became in 2010, I think it was, an AMI NAMTA orientation, which meant that we had to shape up the theory because uh, an orientation before that was more, there was theory, but there was also a lot of practitioners sharing, you know, like case studies, their mm -hmm. best uh, practices. Yes. But when it became an AMI NAMTA uh, orientation, we really started to dig deep in the theory to see what is it that Montessori writes here that we need to make sure it comes across. Mm. You took the question out of my mouth. I don't know if they say that in English, but I was yeah. going to ask you exactly because not, many people don't know what's the difference between the orientation and the diploma course. So maybe we can. Yeah. So, so an orientation, it's, it started off actually um, as uh, six weeks and then later it became five weeks, the orientation. Um, but we, and the orientation then provided um, a week mostly of a residential experience. It had to offer that. I think with the, the, the diploma course, also there two very important aspects were added. And one was observation because the, those taking the orientation didn't have to observe. And observation is really crucial in a Montessori training. And it's really important for us to be aware of that. And then there is also something that is like a practicum, something that is to correspond maybe to the practice teaching done uh, for the other in the other trainings. Mm -hmm. So if people want to take a diploma course, where can they go? Well, they can go uh, as far as I understand, there are four different uh, places. You can take it in Mexico, mm -hmm. in, in, in Spanish. Um, there is one with train Montessori in the States. Okay. Used to be, I'm not sure now, so I don't know, but usually we, we used to say great work, but I yes. think it's called mm -hmm. train, train Montessori. And then it's um, the Ohio Mont International Montessori Training Center. Mm. So that's in the US and then in other parts of the world? No, so it's it's in Mexico, two in oh, US, yes. and then yes, one in, yes. in Sweden. Mm. In Sweden, okay. And and now I'm I'm just back from India, so we did the very first adolescent diploma course in India. Mm. Yeah, would you like to share a little bit about that because you just came back, so it's fresh in your memory. Absolutely. So of course, um, India is very different. And, and it was an amazing experience. 
uh, it also made me aware of how important it is to customize Montessori to the culture where mm. you are and to understand that everything cannot be done as we usually do it you know, in the Western part of the world where I live. So it was really a humbling experience. And what I enjoyed uh, mostly was the simple life but it was just simple in terms of the physical environment in a way, but it was very rich spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have a lot to learn from um, their culture and their ways of, of doing things. I don't think that would harm us. I think that would enrich our lives actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's, that's really lovely. Uh, and inspiring for people to hear, I think, especially in the Western part of the world. <laughs> and um, Jenny, there are many people around the world who are building adolescent programs. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you were to give them one advice, <laughs> how to go about it, because I actually, we get that question a lot. Uh, how do you, you know, I get these emails from people, I'm sure you get them as well. How do you build an adolescent program? Can I have a call with you? Can you share with me how do you build an adolescent program? And, uh, and, and they are people who are inspired and, you know, they would love to do it. Mm, what would you suggest or just like, is there some advice that you would like to share? Mm. It's a big question, I, I know. I, I know. <laughs> and I think that I think the adults working with adolescents are, are very important. They really have to enjoy adolescence. They also have to love work and they have to love all kinds of work mm. uh, and be, be um, ready to do whatever work is needed together with the adolescents. And I think that just like any other, you know, plane of development, I think as an adult, you have to understand that you are not it, but you are working together uh, with, you know, young people here who come with potentialities and come with possibilities and are very capable people, but they might not... Um, or be they might not be aware of that themselves yet, but 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 they are, and they are truly remarkable people. I th I think. Mm. And then I think you have to trust Montessori, and I think that is the most difficult thing, because that is the the what I hear the most. You know that you are you are a subject teacher, and you are so worried that. You know, I'm here to teach math. <laughs> and now we are supposed to do something else. And when will my math be taught? And they are so, so worried about, you know, a national curriculum or how things will fit in. And in my experience, one doesn't have to be that um, worried. It will be fitted in. And, and uh, you just have to trust Montessori that you know, I think she was brilliant and, and it worked so well for first plane and it works so well for elementary. So why shouldn't it work for the adolescents? And I think it, it does. And I think the only obstacles really are us, we, the adults who do not maybe all the time, neither trust the adolescents nor Montessori. We have to have some faith in both here, I think, in order to be successful. And yeah and also try to keep the parents in the loop so they are not, so they don't get anxious, you know. Mm. Yeah, um, so people really need to study Montessori before they start adolescent programs, right? I, I think so. And maybe also visit um, um, other environments. And I think also, you know, you also need to know something about the first plane and the second plane. 
So you actually can meet the adolescent understanding who, who he or she is because they come with 12 years of experience and 12 years of constructing themselves as an individual. And I think it helps if we know about that. What are the books that people should read if they right now can't go and take an orientation or take a diploma course and they would like to start studying? What books would you recommend? Yeah, I, I think they need to study um, the four planes of development so they understand that each plane is equally important and has its own contribution, important contribution to, to human development. Um, and then I think that they, they, of course, I think we all need to start with the appendixes A and B and C in from childhood to adolescence. But that doesn't really tell us about, you know, the, the, her view on human development as such. And I do think it helps if we have that framework. Uh, and understand, so we understand why she says what she says for the adolescents. And then there is this AMI communication. Yes. 2011, dedicated to the adolescents, which, where mm -hmm. there are many good lectures by Montessori, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for uh, reminding me of that. I will make sure that when we put out the podcast, we put a link where to find out about that for people. Yes. To it used to be out of print, but it has been reprinted. Mm. Okay. Um, parents is parents of adolescents is a, another really amazing topic to talk about. We don't have time, but maybe we can later on have uh, another call and discuss uh, how we can support parents yes. of, of adolescents. And uh, it's a topic close to my heart because I am a mother of four children and one one of my, my oldest child is turning, Jenny, he's turning 18 this June. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I look at him because he's on my, some of, you know, the, the photographs I have and when I, and, and yeah, he looks so young there when he's making sausages and now I know I saw him last year. So yeah, a tall, handsome young man. Mm. Yes. Yes, and he, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I myself didn't have a, uh, the happiest of childhoods and especially the adolescent age. Uh, my parents used a lot of physical punishment and I really didn't have any good relationship with them. But uh, so I was really afraid of what it's going to be like when my old children become, go to, into the adolescent age. I had all this fear of like, you know, how am I gonna be a mother uh, with all that experience and um, Christoph is such an amazing young man it just blows my mind every time he comes in the morning and says good morning mom I look at him and I just <laughs> yeah I just love him so much and uh, the experience and I think you know the decision to uh, act upon what I knew are his needs when he became an adolescent, was the best decision of my life, one of the best decisions of my life. And I think that, I think, I, I, of course, I agree with you there. And I think that's true also for all planes, you know, that when, when, when needs are met and they are in an environment which is right for them, <laughs> then, then children and adolescents show totally different characteristics. Miracles happen when that when we yeah. allow children. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Christoph was talking the other day about the summer coming up and he was thinking, I have to get in touch with Jenny about the summer job. Yeah, is he coming? <laughs> I don't know. He might be going to for the rest of his life every summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's welcome. <laughs> well, Let him know he's welcome. We're yeah. looking forward to that. <laughs> I was actually thinking maybe, you know, to put a little seed in his head, who would he like to do the diploma course or the orientation yes. course? Yeah, yes. something like that. Okay, Jenny, thank you so thank much. Thank well, you so thank much you, for Mirka. With me. Um, you know, at the beginning, you said you, uh, you felt you, at some point of life, you realized you were privileged. And I, at some parts of this talk today, of our discussion, when I was listening to you, I had goosebumps. 
Yeah. And I was just thinking, I'm so privileged to know you and to be able to learn from you and to listen to your stories. And this was such a, an amazing hour for me. Just, you know, forget the podcast, just this one hour of us being able to talk and meet, being able to listen to you. Thank you so much. Well, the pleasure was mine. And you are right. I think that, you know, I think Montessori does more to us than we can do for Montessori, I, I, I think. And I think it's, you know, I usually say when people ask me, I say, you know, that when I met Montes Montessori as this approach, I think it just went right into my heart. And I think that it just added an extra dimension to my life. And I'm sure you feel the same. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking this time. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, I'm really hoping that people who listened to our conversation today enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this inspiring Montessori story. I hope it encouraged you. I hope you learned something from it. And I hope that you realize that you are not alone on your Montessori journey. I'm looking forward to speaking with my next guest. And as we say in Czech language, Naslišeno in two weeks. Yours with love, Mirka from Montessori Institute Prague.